Oh, I think this is, oh, it is working, apologies. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome uh, joining us today in the fantastic and extremely august surroundings of Cork City Hall's council chambers. So I know it's been the scene of, I'm sure, many a lively debate and discussion, and I'm really looking forward to the one we're going to have today. It's really brilliant to be here in Cork for the European Commission's event on shining a light on the impact our shared European Union membership has had on Cork and in the wider southern region. So by way of introduction, my name is Noelle O'Connell and I'm the CEO of European Movement Ireland and I'm very honoured to be today's event moderator for the Commission event. However, in addition to that, I'm also a proud Cork woman, so I'm equally delighted to be back home. I don't have to worry about A, my accent, or B, how quickly I speak, which makes a nice change. So thank you very much in advance for that. And if I can, in particular, thank uh, the Lord Mayor of Cork, Councillor Kieran McCarthy, who will formally welcome us to, to his very nice uh, home, and then delighted that he will be followed by the Mayor of the County of Cork, Councillor Franco Flynn. And of course, if I may, on all our behalfs, a particularly warm welcome to our guest of honour and our keynote speaker, Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability and Capital Markets Union, Commissioner Mairead McGuinness. So a very warm welcome, Commissioner, to the real capital of Ireland. Yes. So. <laughs> So Commissioner McGuinness keynote address will follow the uh, opening remarks by both the Lord Mayor and the Mayor. And we're really privileged to have such a superb panel of speakers to get under the bonnet of today's theme of unlocking EU opportunities for Cork. And that panel is Dr. Ruth Freeman, Director of Science for Society with Science Foundation Ireland, Donald Sheehan, Project Manager of the Bride Project, Biodiversity Regeneration in a Daring Environment, and David Kelly, Director of the Southern Regional Assembly. I'm really looking forward to hearing their insights on how the EU cooperation and impact has benefited and enhanced Cork and the wider hinterland. And as well, if I may pay thank you and a big thank you to Cork City Council for kindly hosting today's event in Cork City Hall and in the Council Chamber. I think the last time I was downstairs, I was probably in a fesh as a 12 year old. So it's, uh, it's great to be here for today's event and particular thanks to the Chief Executive of the Council and Doherty and all her colleagues and the fantastic team for all their support. And finally, a very warm welcome to our distinguished audience. I'm delighted we have a number of MEPs, of TDs, of senators and councillors and audience from right across Cork here with us today in person and I know many more following us online. So a very warm welcome to you all. And it's fair to say that Cork has always been a city that has been special, but there's increasingly ever more so a European feel to Cork, and not least because uh, it was resplendent last night, lit up in the colours of the EU flag. So just in terms of today's event, um, some housekeeping points, if I may. I know there's always housekeeping uh, for these types of events. Uh, in terms of uh, Slido, we will be using Slido as an audience interaction platform doing today's events via the QR code. You can log on slido.com and the hashtag is EU for Cork. For those of you active on social media, that's going to be the hashtag as well. So feel free to put it in your browser, but put your phones on silent if we can, please. We don't want any, uh, we don't want any Batman theme tunes interrupting today's event. Um, so we're going to be using this platform for the interactive Q&A and also it'll help our online audience send in questions. Fire and safety instructions, just to, to uh, read those out for everybody. Hopefully they won't be recorded Required, but in the interest of safety, please note the position of and access to the exit from this council chamber. There's one exit at the entrance to the public galleries and in the event of emergency, please walk quickly to the exit directly down the stairs and make, uh, and make your way to the outside following the instructions of staff members. Do not delay and do not return unless you're advised that it is safe to do so. Thank you. So after our keynote speeches uh, from the commissioner, we will then move on to our panel discussion and time for audience Q&A. So 
that's where I'm going to uh, uh, sing for my supper a little bit because we'll have a roving mic for you, the audience in person, and also online and then also on Slido. So I'm sure we're going to have a fantastic seminar, a really packed agenda to get through. And if I can, we've, uh, we must try and all keep to time. That's, uh, that's not least a reminder to myself as a Blarney woman, prone more to verbosity than brevity, but I will do my, my best and follow my own instructions. So without further ado, if I can invite Lord Mayor of Cork, Councillor Kieran McCarthy, to deliver his formal welcome. Thank you. Uh, dear Commissioner McGuinness, uh, dear councillors uh, Bogue and Ford uh, and Boyle, uh, and Ford and Boyle are active members, myself and the European Committee of the Regions. Uh, dear Noel uh, of the European Movement Ireland, you're, you're really, really welcome to Cork and thanks for bringing the roadshow to Cork. Uh, and dear David and staff from the Southern Regional Assembly and dear executive members of Cork City Council, including Anne Doherty, Fergal Reading, Reedy and Ronan Jing uh, Jingles, and dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, and dear Senator Buttermore and dear Deputy Stanton, you are all very, very, very welcome to this historic, um, what I call House of Democracy. Uh, here at this lunchtime. Um, I have but three very short uh, messages, if I may, in my welcome speech. Um, my first message is bound up with my local historian hat. Um, you are in a room that's full of narratives and civic symbolism and it's full of stories of democracy. And let me tell you, this is the seventh known City Hall in Cork City that you're actually in, the seventh. Um, so we've had a long history uh, in Cork City, about a thousand years of democratic uh, representation. Uh, this very City Hall as well was designed and the plans presented to the public uh, 100 years ago um, this spring. Um, and this City Hall in this beautiful crafted council chamber uh, was formally opened in 1936, but every single piece from the balustrades to the cornicing uh, to the dome uh, was all master crafted by Cork people for Cork people, uh, and that in itself is an important uh, symbol of democracy. Uh, also, the chamber was designed with people in mind to embrace it, to enjoy it, to sit in it, and also to use their voice. So, in fact, if I turned off the mic, you should be able to hit, still hear me if I project. Um, and when I say all of that, uh, such a space uh, is very much embraced by my 30 councillor colleague, uh, colleagues. See, Thomas Maloney is here as well, down the back. I've been very fortunate to work with colleagues who care deeply about democracy. They care deeply about Cork's community. In essence, um, its essence, the essence of Cork, its people, and um, the representative people, its neighborhood, where every meeting um, is a chance to make a difference. And in my time, some days in this particular space, we've won incredible things for the city. And during other days, we remain just pushing inch by inch uh, or stuck or have gone back to the drawing board. But we've always remained true to a forward-looking um, path. Um, I can add to all these metaphors. I can tell you City Hall is built on 400 oak trees going down to the ground. Why do I, why do I connect that to this? Um, because this, in one sense, the type of democracy that's found here, in a sense, grows physically from the bottom up from the foundations of the building. Um, it's built on stable supports. And uh, it's important for democracy to have stable um, supports. Um, there's a Latin inscription uh, engraved in the city's coat of arms in the center of the mayoral platform. Uh, you can see the two towers, the ship in between, the Statio Bene Fide Carinus, a safe harbor for ships. Um, I think it's very, very important that you could actually reinterpret the safe harbour for ships um, this afternoon as a safe harbour for people or a safe place for people. This space is also a safe harbour for people. Why do I say all these different metaphors and different kind of symbols? Um, because these values for Cork, these democratic values, they also entwine with the values of the European Union. Um, a safe place for people, a safe harbour for people. Uh, in the European Union, um, though, uh, there are 270 regions. Um, there's 100,000 local and regional authorities. There's 1.1 uh, local public reps that do care about their regions uh, and their cities and their urban areas and their rural areas. Um, and I think they also champion the safe harbour for people mantra in their own way. So my first message is that whatever we unlock in our ongoing relationship with the EU, we need to make sure the grassroots are involved. Um, that there is much experience at grassroots level and that the idea of a safe harbour for people uh, needs to be embraced. Uh, my second message is that uh, in this city we have an ambitious Cork City Development Plan uh, from 2022 to 2028 uh, and at its heart is about building a safe harbour for people. Um, Cork at this moment in time has a population of over 220,000 people. Um, it's an emerging international city of scale, a national driver of economic and urban growth. Uh, we've taken the priorities to heart of the National Development Plan, the National Planning Framework, the 
regional spatial strategy for a region, and we've turned them into lenses, new lenses to harness the evolving thinking, the evolving approaches to urban issues, and ultimately, ultimately to create evolving strategies to future-proof um, our city. And Cork's urban agenda, in essence, seeks to make sure our citizens are at the front and centre of our priorities. Cork City Council, my dear friends, is on the front line in building the future of communities in Cork. We are proud to be a story builder, we're proud to be a strategy builder, and we're proud to be a capacity builder. And we do seek to reduce homelessness, making sure construction of our new social housing projects keep on track, um, affordable housing keeps on track, um, adding to sustainable mobility plans, uh, enhancing the offering of the city centre, uh, working with people like the WHO and our, our WHO Healthy Cities project, and the list is a long one. In particular, Cork City Council has placed a strong focus uh, on the Sustainable Development Goals, um, SDG 11, the Sustainable Cities, and SDG 13 on climate action in particular. And when we've sprinkled a lot of those priorities with energy ambition that a second city brings, or what I call Ireland's southern capital, and one gets a very exciting future for our city by the River Lee. In essence, my dear friends, my second message is that for Cork's present and future is that there has been a serious and detailed mapping of ambitions and visions in place. And we all need to partner up to make sure that any opportunities that are there need to be unlocked. And any challenges that are there, that we actually face them together and not in a silo as manner. My third message, my dear friends, and my last message is that for many years, uh, Cork City Council has been involved in unlocking much leverage and learning from European programs. Um, that's through the support of our EU Managing Authority, the Southern Regional Assembly. Um, I acknowledge David Kelly, who's, he, who's there. Uh, David, in particular, the last few years has been fantastic to unlock urban funding section from the ERDF for Mary Ellen's Bridge and Marina Park uh, Phase 1, and that's much appreciated, all the work that you've done. And in particular, in recent years, uh, through the leadership of Anne Doherty, uh, who's been a, a fantastic leader of this organization and the executive for the last 10 years, that we also have a European Affairs Officer uh, in place. And I wish to acknowledge uh, Ronan Jingles and his amazing work in making um, us and the Council, the, the political side and the executive side of the Council, aware of thematic programmes such as Urbact, Interreg, Horizon Europe, uh, and also programmes within the EU Urban Agenda, and now the European Urban Initiative, uh, and also connecting us to have a chat at least with um, um, banks like the European Investment Bank. Um, indeed, concerning the urban agenda for the EU, um, I was the rapporteur of an opinion on the early implementation on the urban agenda for the EU. So, and I've been on, working on that since 2016 uh, uh, within, the European kind of committee, within the European Committee of the Regions. The urban agenda for the EU is basically made up of 16 thematic kind of partnerships looking at areas from housing to poverty uh, to climate action. Um, it's really, really interesting when you start digging into the different reports that were kind of commissioned um, with the partnerships. Um, and one of the things that kind of emerged in the partnerships is that for cities to move forward, um, they need more funding, better funding better regulation and actually better knowledge and those, and those three ideas as well are something that I subscribe to within here and something that, I've been, that we've all been pushing for hitting here, uh, my colleagues um, included. Um, as part of that, um, there are a number of European initiatives that have kind of uh, been connected to, to the, European, uh, the European urban agenda, uh, in particular the Green Deal. Um, I think that needs a more integrated approach um, and certainly the other um, programs such as um, the, Fit for 50, the, the Fit for 55 package, I think it is a massive game changer but it hasn't been discussed really at local and regional authority level. Uh, the Just Transition Fund is very, very welcome uh, but the idea of a just transition, it needs more debate at local level. Uh, the Horizon Missions, the five Horizon Missions are a game changer in bringing together ideas and programs to local and regional authorities and in particular the 100 climate neutral cities by 2030 of which Cork is a part of, and I think there's 112 cities at this moment in time, but we need support from different DGs in the European Commission for our mission in this regard uh, to su succeed. Um, I'm also the rapporteur on, on digital Europe strategies at local and regional level, uh, and Cork City Council in particular has been a participant in the Commission's Digital Cities Challenge and now the Intelligent Cities Challenge. I'm also the rapporteur on the new European Bauhaus, which also kind of opens up more ideas as well for local authorities. But my dear friends, my third message very much is that there have been many EU urban related programs for Cork that Cork City Council has been involved with. Uh, and, and has learned from and continues to be involved with. Um, and in particular, we need a lot of support for the European Horizon Mission Programme on the 100 climate neutral cities by 2030. 
To conclude, um, you are very, very welcome to this uh, chamber, uh, Commissioner, but let me reiterate my three messages. Um, let's keep building um, the European Union and spaces like this, and as I said, there's 100,000 of these um, across the European Union as safe harbours for people. Um, my second message is that there, ha there is a serious and detailed mapping of ambitions, visions in place um, that needs to connect to the EU and the EU need to connect to us, uh, and also that we need to partner up more um, so that any opportunities that should be unlocked and do appear are harnessed. Now I've just realised I've chucked what I call chucked a truckload of stuff at you. Um, but maybe at its essence, I'm really, really excited always that Cork is part of the European Union and that we're doing our, we're we're partnering up a lot more. There are silos still to come down, um, but let's keep let's keep working with each other. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks very much, uh, Lord Mayor, and fantastic to, to get an insight into the brilliant initiatives that, that Cork City Council and, and you and all your colleagues are to the fore in driving forward at a European level. And now I'm delighted to invite uh, the Mayor of Cork County to say a, a few opening remarks, Councillor Franco Flynn. Councillor, thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. Walter Ortgolea. Couple of folk are all with. First of all, I want to welcome and delighted to be here in Cork uh, City this evening, for Cork City, Cork County. I want to thank you, Noel, our moderator of Farron Tea for the evening. I have no doubt you're going to be there with a strict hand and guide us. Uh, first of all, I'm delighted that I welcome the Commissioner. Thank you most sincerely, Maria, for coming here. It's nice to take time out of your busy schedule and out to come here to the, the real capital of Ireland. <laughs> Maria, you are always an always admirer of yours. My wife especially, and I think the Plown Championships without Maraid McGuinness is like a summer without sunshine. And of course, especially the Farmer's Bible, the Farmer's Journal, the weekly column that you carried in Maraid was, um, was the most sought after. And I think most of the ladies especially, they bought it for your column. And you definitely, and I have no doubt that when you did go to Europe, I said to many, many of my friends, I said, we have a vice, a rural vice, a family vice, and an Irish vice. And we're lucky to have someone like you there batting for us. And everyone know that here in Ireland, we've some, still some people saying, Europe has been good for Ireland. Europe has been absolutely outstanding and long may it continue. And we're delighted to have someone there at the table batting for Irish, batting for rural Ireland, batting for all of Ireland. But I would say especially the farming community, because I know it is so close to your heart. And thank you most sincerely for taking time out to be with us this evening, because you are busy. And it's busy because you know the importance of what Cork means and of what Europe means to Ireland. But I think I'm delighted. I know many, many people say, God, Maria is doing well out there. I also want to welcome uh, Anne Dart here, our Chief Executive, who I know for many, many years. The Cahillac of Shannon Dearden, another very, very busy man. I think our pets cost three or four times a day, as, as Senator Jerry Bottomer, and also the local uh, Cox City councillors and local county councillors. I won't mention any names because I'm bound to mi uh, miss out on some. And uh, the, the other I met in just out of window, she said, Frank, I'm going to the 125th anniversary of Cox County Council. What an honour. Founded in 1899. Chain, valued it, insured for a million, I hope one bad, but the 1899. The other was a valued member of uh, Cork County Council for many, many years, and we look forward to Also, I want to welcome David Stanton, who was also making the journey to uh, um, Cork County Hall on the same day, and I want to mention uh, especially all the councillors from both the city and the county. I also want to a good friend of mine, I served in the regional authority, and very, very important, because they decide where the funding is, and the members there, and they make the case that is David Kelly, who more than, uh, more than welcome. Lord Mayor of Cork City, Councillor Kieran McCarthy, Commissioner Maureen McGuinness, ladies, gentlemen, and distinguished guests, a card. I'm delighted to join the Commissioner Maureen McGuinness and our ex extraordinary, experienced, distinguished panel of speakers here this afternoon. To welcome everybody here to Cork City Hall and indeed to Cork, both online and in person, for this hybrid event. EU for Cork, unlocking opportunities for Cork. And I'll just mention one or two projects, and one is very, very close to my heart. That is the Bright Project. Farming with nature, that's what it's all about. And as a dairy science graduate in UCC, I'm working all my life, 43 years with the dairy industry, with Dairy Gold Co-op, 
and proud of it. And you always made a vi um, visit our stand, the dairy call stand, and one of the highlights of was when uh, Marietta came in, because we knew then we'd get the coverage on the Farmer's Journal. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm delighted to have my good friend, Doran Sheehan, who is the driver of that. He's passionate about it. And no one has done more for the Bright Project than Doran. And it's great to have him here this evening as one of your key speakers. And also I'm delighted that as a member of LEADER, and you know what LEADER has done for this country. Volunteer effort, local crossroads. There isn't a single parish or crossroads in Ireland that hasn't benefited from LEADER funding. Now some have lost out. They are the ones that didn't look for it. But Maraid, there's no better project has given more benefit to Ireland than the LEADER project. And I'm delighted as a member and vice chairman of the Blackwater Leader Group, a local leader group, and for my, how helpful they have been to Donal in driving this, not alone in funding, but also in the advice. Designing and implementing a results-based approach to conserve, enhance, and restore habitats in lowland intensive farmland is of immense importance to a county like Cork and to Ireland, with three major rivers traversing that part of North Cork. It is a project and projects like this that are vital to a thriving agricultural economy and tourism sector here in Cork, Cork County. Cork is an incredibly diverse county from stunning coastlines to rural landscapes with unique towns and villages. I would like to acknowledge EU funding which has made major projects, such as the Bride, which have real underground impact and in fact benefit all the people who live in rural Ireland and who live in these areas. But also those who visit in the most sustainable way possible. I have seen first hand, I've been in many visits to Doran's Farm, many, many groups of farmers have come there. They come from the EU, they come from all over Europe. And I tell you one thing, you just, I know from my office in Blackwater Leader, if Dolan gets a ring, it's eight o'clock at night, we'll be there in the following morning, Dolan is there to help a lending hand. I'm looking forward to hearing and learning from our guest speakers here today. Thank you, and let's all enjoy today's event. Ramil Mahagiv Galea. Mina Mahogov, Frank, thank you very much for that, Mayor. Thank you. Um, and now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted and very honoured to invite our keynote speaker and our guest of honour for today's European Commission event, uh, the Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability and Capital Markets Union, Mairead McGuinness. We've, we've heard a, a little bit about uh, the Commissioner's past uh, in, in her farmer's journal and her, her fantastic journalist days. Um, but of course, to all of us, she is uh, very well known, not least as a former first vice president of the European in Parliament, where she will remain trending and viral on all things social media for all her engagements with Mr. Farage on all our behalves, I think. So, chapeau, Commissioner, on that. But um, the Commissioner has had a fantastic uh, uh, and busy schedule with us, and I think we're really honoured that she's here with us today. And she has got uh, such a range of experience on so many different platforms, and I'm really looking forward to her keynote address. And it is uh, my honour to invite Commissioner McGuinness to deliver her speech. Thank you. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. I, I don't blush much, but I did just <laughs> that earlier intervention. I do have an apology to make before I start. I'm not from Cork. Uh, I wish I was, because they've got those sort of dulcet tones. I mean, three very different tones from Cork, but then Cork is very different, and the regions have their own attributes. I am known to be a little bit of a mimic, but I shall desist. And I see Dorney Cashman who's long-standing representative of farmers. And I see many faces that I know, so without naming others, uh, can, can I just say a huge thank you, first of all, for this invitation. Um, it's been said that uh, a time out of my busy schedule, this is really important for my schedule because I am here to learn and to listen. Um, and the extraordinary thing is when we go into a room as 27 
commissioners representing 27 member states, it is so important that I can talk about being in Cork and that they hear what's happening here. Um, and the day we break that connection between our grassroots and the Brussels level is, is it will be a very dire day. And I think we can do more and we can do it better. So events like this are core to my work and it's a great way to start the week. I'll be in Brussels tomorrow and we'll have a college meeting on Wednesday and I promise to mention Cork in that meeting to have you in the minutes uh, so that I can reflect on it. I have to say the weather didn't help. Uh, but I was very well covered coming into the uh, building um, and thank you for that. So officially to say to Lord Mayor and Councillor Kieran McCarthy, we know each other and I commend your work. You made a, a fantastically spirited contribution with three core messages that I have noted. Um, we've met on other occasions and I really would love to have your depth of knowledge around history. Um, and we, in, indeed in your opening remarks, you very quickly uh, wrapped uh, all around the whole story of Cork and its very deep history and I was able to see all of those physical manifestations in your fantastic office. My office is not quite as beautiful and in fact I don't think I'd bring you to it but you are welcome of course uh, if you do call my way. And then there's um, the Mayor of uh, the Chair of Cork County Council who as you said describe my history, which is 20 years old actually, because I'm in, in the European dimension for 20 years, but thank you uh, Councillor Franco Flynn for recalling the ploughing, because if ever there was grassroots they grow there. Um, and indeed I've always relished it, but I have to say I mentioned the ploughing while with the Lord Mayor earlier, because when the sandwiches arrived in, I made the observation, there's a very large plate, I said, what are the others having? And then I said, if this was the ploughing I would hold on to all of them, because at the ploughing you eat when you can. Uh, and also, can I just uh, record our, our thanks to uh, the meeting we had with the CEO and Doherty. I acknowledge members of the Iraq this year, members of Cork City and, and Town Council, and I commend all of your work collectively. The European Commission Office are very involved in this. Thank you for doing this work with European Movement. It's bringing together a lot of voices and a lot of forces, and please say what you need to say so that I can bring your uh, message back home. You know, Cork has a huge history and tradition. Um, the port has its own story and its place in the world in terms of exports, imports, we all know of that. Uh, but the past is never the future and I think what we're all trying to do at the European level is to get the best out of all of the regions, towns, cities, villages and rural and also learn from each other. Uh, and that is the added value that the European Union brings, not just to Ireland but to all of the member states. And there are challenges around growth, uh, as we know in this country, uh, around housing, infrastructure, etc., and water, even though we have lots of it. It may indeed come up in the conversation. I mean, one of the big benefits for Cork, for Ireland, for all cities, towns, rural areas of being part of the European Union, and I sometimes think we forget it, is the single market. And we need to deepen it, make it work better. But funding, of course, is really important, and we will be talking about the benefits uh, that come to this area uh, from EU funding. Um, and indeed, many of the projects, big and small, um, have received EU funding in this area. And, and that kickstarts not just physical projects, but also ideas. Uh, that brings jobs, it brings community development. And I want to mention uh, former MEP Liam Highland uh, because the leader program was referenced. And he was an MEP, I was still a journalist, and I wrote about the leader program. And it's extraordinary from very small idea that he had, and he pursued it in the European Parliament, and it became a real living project across Europe. And it is about bottom-up development, very impressive. And I think we should always acknowledge the work of those who, who may not be in the news, but have left a very big mark uh, on the European Union. But I'm looking at some examples of funding. So if I take the European Regional Development Fund, it has contributed 3 million euros to the Cyber Innovate program at Munster Technological University. And this program really helps students to go into the cybersecurity sector. It's really strong here in Cork. I would like to hear more about that um, because cybersecurity, in my view, is one of the really important topics. I look after the financial system. It's a long title, but it's basically about finance. And one of my real worries is um, a sustained and successful attack 
on the financial system and its impact on society. Because we all saw in the past when there were runs at ATMs, there, there can be huge social disruption. So this is a really important program. I then will move to other programs like the development of the Marina Park in the South Docks. This also benefited from that European uh, Development Fund to the tune of 3.25 million euros, and that's going towards park uh, recreation activities, particularly water sports and event spaces. And then students and teachers in this region have benefited from over 37 million euros in Erasmus Plus grants between 2021 and 2023 alone. The most active organizations availing of funding are University College Cork, Munster Technological University, Cork Education and Training Board, and Cork English College. But of course, the rural areas of Cork uh, County have benefited too. And some of figures here, just between 2014 and 2020, um, Cork uh, County was allocated 16 million euros for community-led rural development projects, including outdoor recreational spaces, renovations of community facilities, community halls, support to develop youth arts and training programs, and agricultural enterprise and tourism. And I think this funding shows that the EU values regions and it values rural areas. Cork also performs exceptionally well in the EU's highly competitive research and innovation program, Horizon Europe, with dozens of international collaborations and individual grants. Again, some examples. In 2022, UCC secured three prestigious European Research Council grants to the value of 4.75 million euro, more than any other Irish higher education institution that year. And Ocean Way Venture Limited, an initiative based in Black Rock, will receive 100,000 as part of a 4.6 million Horizon Europe research and innovation program called CSTAR. And the aim of this uh, program, research program, is to establish an industrial system for harnessing tidal energy. Compu commuter, rather, rail services in Cork will benefit from 164 million from the EU's post-COVID recovery and resilience fund. And this will enable station upgrades, electrification and new equipment, allowing more of us, more passengers, to travel by, tra uh, by rail, and that alleviates road traffic and reducing the carbon emissions. Uh, the three phase one elements of this program are signalling upgrade, the development of a, a through platform at Kent Station and double tracking from Glanthorne to Middleton are on track to be completed by the end of 2026. Um, let's look to the future then. Um, so there is one recent example in Cork of large scale uh, infrastructure I've just mentioned. Uh, I think the future is not just about the money and projects, it's about people, knowledge, policy formation. Uh, and that's happening here in Cork, uh, and there is support for all of that, including uh, trials of different technologies and policies to inform approaches on energy efficiency and social housing, uh, including film festivals like the Cork International Film Festival, uh, which has benefited from Creative Europe media support, and this promotes Europe's film and audiovisual sector, and funding for youth services and adult literacy, uh, indeed, uh, studies, for example, to inform the relocation of the Port of Cork, freeing up a vast urban brownfield site that I've just had a discussion with in our earlier meeting. And Europe also helps support Cork's commitment to tackling climate change, with a dozen projects approved over the past year under a range of EU programmes, again demonstrating uh, that the EU is about more than funding, it's about ideas, knowledge and sharing information. Um, and I think that, you know, reference was made by the Lord Mayor of Learning because uh, you do a lot of work at the European level, but you also bring a lot of knowledge uh, and uh, information which others value around the table. And I think we should never underestimate the capacity of smaller member states to be very impactful. And there is something, I think, about Irish representatives. And I, 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 do I see MEPs? I think I do. Hans Susilov and Shaw, uh, I think we see one, uh, um, Grace, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, but it is important to reference that uh, you can have a very strong voice even from a small member state and sometimes more so. Um, I think we have to find a way, we can't shout our way through or bang a table, we kind of go around, you know, finding ways to 
And I suppose my, my um, journey in the European Parliament, if it taught me anything, was patience and perseverance and learning that the best way to make progress was to speak when it was important to speak, but more importantly, to be more silent. Uh, because you learn a little bit more by being silent. And I'm conscious of my time here, so I will try and rush through the rest of this. Uh, what I would say um, is that being part of Europe, and thank you again, um, Councillor um, Flynn, for your remarks about uh, how Europe has been so important for Ireland. We're, this is our 51st year of membership. Um, and there have been ups and downs, as there always will be. But it has really allowed regions like Cork, cities like Cork, uh, to grasp opportunities um, and including highlighting that this city is really important for innovation. If I look to last year alone, Cork was awarded third place in the contest for the European Rising Innovative City. This is a huge achievement. It recognised Cork's climate neutrality, smart city and innovation cluster building efforts. And again, what topics are more important than those? Um, this recognition, in my view, should benefit Cork's homegrown and international companies by encouraging greater investment in the region. And that is made easier because we're part of a single market. So everything hinges on us working and being together. And our market isn't just a small few million people here in Ireland. It's a, a market of 450 million people, which is an economic powerhouse. Um, but as I say, we could deepen uh, the single market and make more of it. And I think that is the challenge that this college has been working on and it will be the challenge for the incoming European Parliament and indeed uh, the uh, next co uh, College of Commissioners. Uh, sometimes we think of Europe as rules and regulations. I would like to turn those two words into certainty for business. So if you're in Europe and you're in a single market, you're not dealing with 37 different rules and regulations, you're dealing with one set. Um, and, and that really, I suppose, is just accepted without being understood as very significant when you are working within a single market. Europe, Brussels, for example, they talk of the Brussels effect. Uh, so I'll be in the United States next week talking about the whole financial story, if you like, in Europe. And while um, there are differences in nuances uh, in the US, indeed in an election year in particular, there is an awareness of what Europe is doing on climate, how we're managing that, um, and we do have an influence globally. And I think we have to hold on to that responsibility uh, as much as it is an opportunity that we show leadership even in difficult times when there is a bit of a push against some of the move in that direction. And maybe we can have a discussion around that because I think it is important to, to openly discuss where there are concerns. Lots of other rights you have here, but I think I'll hold them. There is an official speech to say all of that. Lastly, may, may I just say two topics. One is my own area of finance. Um, I talk about banking union and capital markets union a great deal, but I'm very conscious uh, that when I was canvassing in four uh, elections for the European Parliament, nobody ever came up and, and said, tell me what's happening on CMU, on capital markets union, and rightly so, because we have failed to make it real for people, or indeed banking union, but people do say, why is it that I can't get a mortgage from... Belgium or France, or how is it that they have a different structure around um, you know, financing housing? And the reason why there is difference is because in the one area, in particular, where we have not completed the single market is capital, the movement of free movement of capital, which is both, a, in one sense, it's, it's a pity we haven't, but it's also an opportunity. But I would say there is gathering and growing momentum to do something and do something quite fundamental here. And it is because we have to um, find a lot of finance uh, to invest in this just transition, as you referenced, Lord Mayor, but in this transition towards a more sustainable economy and society and a more digital economy and society. And while the public purse will be involved and the European budget will be involved, private investment is crucial. And we are great savers here in Europe. I won't ask how much you've all saved collectively, but I, I bet it's a pretty penny because we do save, but we don't invest. And saving is fine and you need a little for a rainy day, but we need to invest in the longer term. And it is an agenda that I'm pushing and I'm getting less resistance. And I would ask that our European leaders fight this battle and realize that sometimes you have to give up on a member state issue in order to add value, and in particular around finance, uh, banking union, and capital markets union. Um, and then I just want to pick up on the three topics uh, very briefly um, about 
involving the grassroots Lord Mayor. This is key, and I mentioned why I'm very happy to be here. There's no point in a few people talking in a room with great ideas and thinking that they have all of the great ideas if we haven't listened first. And I think sometimes we haven't listened efficiently or effectively. And, and this is why I am here to listen. Uh, the second thing about partnership and working together, that unlocks more opportunities than working in silos. We could do better here, both um, I think at community level, at county, regional, and definitely at the European level, and indeed within the institutions of Europe, we can do better. And the last one for me is this discussion around a just transition. I think those two words are, are core, but I, I know they're difficult. It is very hard to guarantee a just transition of leaving no one behind. And it's a commitment we have made, and I think we do have to honor it. And that's why even though we may need to have longer discussions and we may need to alter the time frame of things, we do have to bring people with us or we will fail in our endeavor. Uh, so programs like LEADER are part of bringing Europe uh, closer. But this is a year of elections. You will be running locally, and I know you've already started your local campaigns. I wish you all well. I, I commend those who stand for election at whatever level it is. I have to say, I don't think I'd be fit for local level because you really are the coal face and you get all of the comments, and therefore we need to listen to those who are involved at the local level. And then at national level, um, uh, of course, is key to driving European policy. We will have elections to the European Parliament. Uh, and, and somebody was just saying that despite we're in Europe 50 years, do people really understand how the institutions of Europe work? Um, did I fully understand how they worked before I became an MEP? Do I fully understand today? There's a dynamic about institutions. Essentially, it's about people working together. But I will say two things. Trust in institutions is key, and all of us have a responsibility, I think, to respect institutions. And well, thank you for your, your kind remarks, but also um, for referencing uh, debates I would have chaired. The one thing I was very conscious of, and I'm sure the Lord Mayor will, will share this, as will the Cahirlock, and indeed the Cahirlock of Shanna there, and I have great respect for institutions of the state, of the European level, and at local level, and that no one should Dis dismiss them or disregard them or be disrespectful in them. And I was conscious in moments, of great moments of trauma within the European Parliament when there was a, a neighbor leaving Europe. We never thought this would happen. That it was upon my small shoulders to make sure that our institution of the European Parliament was not disrespected. And really, democracy is under pressure. It's been referenced already. Um, I see it and I feel it over 20 years. Uh, and I think that the more we disrespect the institutions of, and the story that this place holds, uh, the more damage we allow happen. So those of us who have positions have responsibilities um, also to make sure that trust continues. And where trust is breaking, then we have to build it. I'll reference the financial system when trust broke down after 2008, and rightly so. And it's been difficult to rebuild trust. So look, we're here to engage and to listen, and I'm just thrilled to be here. I just wish I had a Cork accent, but you can't have everything in this world. Thank you very much. Thanks a million, Commissioner. I think if you stay here long enough, we'll get the Cork accent out for you, definitely. You, you'll end up leaving with them. That's great. Thank you so much for such a, a powerful keynote address. And I'm delighted that our panel ha has, has joined us a, a little bit like uh, moving chairs. So fantastic. We've, we've a, great, uh, a great panel um, of, of speakers uh, with us today. So I'm going to just ask each of our speakers starting off maybe just a just one question to to, to set the set the scene and and Donal I might come to you first um in your role as not as if you weren't busy enough as a dairy farmer and my condolences with the weather coming from a farm myself I I had a big dose of giving out about the weather this morning as well at home so I know that the challenges you have of course but you also are project manager of the Bride Farming with Nature project and you really have, have such a huge insight into 
how we confront, and it's not just a Cork local issue, but it's a European global issue of climate change, biodiversity loss. And can you tell, tell this audience, because I've, I've heard you talk about the story about the Bride Project, can you maybe tell, tell, tell all of us a little bit more about it and how the EU supported you and enabled your group to come together? Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Noel. And uh, just at the outset, thanks very much for the invitation from the European Movement in Ireland. Um, so it's always a privilege to be able to talk to anybody about the Bride Project. Um, so the, the Bride Project is um, biodiversity regeneration in a daring environment. And um, it's located in the Bride Valley uh, in East Cork, uh, running from uh, Glenville all the way down to um, Tallow uh, and Knockinore in West Waterford, um, uh, where it goes into the Blackwater, the, the Bride River. Uh, that's where the name came from. Um, and it involves... Uh, 43 farmers, um, all from different sectors, and that's important. It's a, it's a, it's a very intensive daring environment. But um, the whole concept of the project was uh, to deal at landscape scale rather than individual farmers. It's really getting as many farmers as possible um, all singing off the same environmental hymn sheet. So the, the project uh, came about when... Um, Two friends of mine, Paul Moore, who's a tillage farmer from Middleton, and Tony Nagel, who's an ecologist from um, Carrigaline. Um, we did a lot of conservation work over the years, and the ecologists would be given out to the farmers about why we couldn't just do this and do that, and you'd bring back this species and bring that back, bring back that species. And I think there was a... Neither of us could see each other's opinion. Um, you know, the, the farmers were getting the blame, and then there was this constant push for, for cheaper food uh, and land use. And um, we decided uh, that, okay, if, if we had a, a clean sheet, um, how, how would you design this uh, agri environment scheme, uh, this perfect agri environment scheme, which is impossible, of course. But um, what we did was in 2014, I was very fortunate, I went out to. Um, to Holland, to a project that was out there um, through EU funding, and it was where farmers were coming together in a, in a very small scale, um, looking after uh, Blacktail Godwitz, which is a, a, a wader that, that was in trouble. And I, I thought it was absolutely fantastic, and um, that was in 2014. And I came back uh, buzzing with um, a, a desire to, to do the same thing in Ireland, and uh, with the two lads, we set about uh, d designing this, this kind of a, a strategy for, for doing exactly that, bringing back biodiversity and intensive farmland. But there was, there was no funding available, and it, it was impossible. We went to Leader, but it, it needed, it, this wasn't a five or 10,000 euro project. I mean, it isn't that we are so big headed that we would turn that down, but it, it needed something more than that. And uh, we, we waited and we waited and there was nothing happening, but then the EIPs uh, came about. So the EIPs are European Innovation Partnerships. And um, what, what they are really is small little mini projects that are scattered throughout Europe. And um, they're, they're dealing with um, mostly environmental issues. Um, so th there's about 50 in Ireland and we were very fortunate to, to receive funding in 2017. And they're really, trying to sort out a big problem in a small scale and seeing then if it can be rolled out further uh, when it's finished. So, so um, we applied for, for funding and we got 1.1 million and we couldn't believe it really, it was fantastic. It, it, was, um, it, it was just what we wanted. And um, the, the thing about the, the, the funding was that there was very little strings attached. Uh, I was surprised that well, we thought we'd be very constrained that you'd have to do this and you'd have to do that. But we were able to design this, this initiative ourselves um, f from day one. And we, we had, all we had, we had the, the department down in Johnstown Castle overseeing it. So that was the, the, the financial side taken care of. You have to put in your budgets and, and, and they won't give you the money unless you have a, a proper budget. So there was transparency and accountability um, from their side. But the measures that were put in place was all up to ourselves, and we had an ecologist and two farmers, which is the proper ingredients for, for uh, improving biodiversity. Um, so, so what we did was we selected um, 43 farmers, and in the opening, uh, when we launched the project, we had 20 seats out in a, a local hall, not, not anything like this. Um, there was 120 people turned up from the wider community and from, the farmer, from farmers as well. And within two weeks, we had uh, 65 applications. We, we had only a budget for 30. 
and we told them um, that we, we, we wouldn't be able to take them all on board and um, we, we asked them to put in an application. There was 43 in very quickly and we, told, we said then that we're going to have to bring it down to 30. There was holy war, there was an anonymous, a unanimous decision taken that nobody should be asked to leave unless they wanted to leave. And so they were more or less accepting that money wasn't the, the, the issue here, and it wasn't. They wanted to make improvements. Um, and if you look at the Year to the Ground program uh, that was filmed at the very start of the project, uh, I couldn't believe it myself. They were doorstepped below at the end of the, of the hall, um, and I said they're going to say the wrong thing here. But e e each one of them were, were out failed. There was five or six of them on it, and they all acknowledged that there was a problem. And they acknowledged that what they were doing was wrong, and, but they, they were aware of it, and they were going to make changes. And this was uh, the key, that they were actually acknowledging there was a problem uh, before we could find a solution. And that was, that was really um, key. It was a turning point. So we gave each of them 2,000 euros for capital measures, planting trees, planting hedgerows, widening buffer margins beside streams, retaining wetlands. Um, and what the whole core of the project was that we, we wanted 10% of their farm in what we call space for nature. And you might think, I'm not sure if anyone is from farming or agricultural backgrounds, 10% is, is a massive amount of land. It, it's paltry, but, but it's a huge amount of land when there's such pressure on producing food at the cost we're producing it for. And that, that 10% is, is the 10% of land that delivers on ecosystem services, re retaining water so that there isn't any flooding, setting aside um, pollinator strips and wild bird cover, retaining hedgerows for carbon sequestration, retaining woodlands for carbon sequestration, um, ma maintaining an environment that people can enjoy it, not just farmers, but the wider public. That, that was that 10%. And the second part of the project was delivering on a results-based payment. So these are RBPs that, that were just coming around in 2017, started off in Ireland by the Burn Project. So we took them, we tweaked them a small bit, and we, when you're giving out a results-based payment, you have to realise that, that it, it's based on results. It's different to the old way, where you just, the easy thing is to just give every farmer 1,000 euros or 2,000 euros. That's very easy. But you, when you give out results-based payments, you're saying this farmer is doing more than that farmer. So it was really targeted payments based on uh, the, the result. And the result was uh, the quantity of space for nature in each farm, and the quality of that space for nature. In other words, the quality of the habitats. So we, we, we tried to get, uh, we designed what's called the Farmland Biodiversity Index, FBI, everybody knows that. And, and um, we, we based the payments based on the amount of space for nature they had and the quality of it. After that, we designed a, a Farming with Nature brand, and that is really the key uh, to, to the future success, in my opinion. Of, of farming, where you want to deliver um, um, more for farmers by putting a product out in the marketplace where each of you can support farmers for farming with nature. Um, and that is, the, that is the, 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 the synopsis of the Bride Project, Farming Fantastic. with Nature. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely uh, fantastic, Donald. And uh, my first job out of college was on a leader project, as, as, so I know the fantastic work it does. So, and I know the commissioner could stay talking to you for hours more, but I'll, I'll be in trouble with her staff. So I'd better, I'd better keep going. So just to say, ladies and gentlemen, because we started a little bit late, and we've such a, a fantastic panel and audience Q and A coming, coming in. We're going to go li uh, just a little bit past two o'clock for just so that everyone is aware and that there isn't a mass exodus in two minutes uh, when it should be finished. Now I'm. I'm delighted to, uh, our next uh, speaker is um, uh, Dr. Abigail Ruth Freeman, who is Director of Science for Society, which is a great title, by the way. I want you to tell us a little bit about that with Science Foundation Ireland. And, we're, and um, Dr. Freeman, we were saying that, you know, as a country, Ireland certainly does uh, punch above its weight internationally in terms of research and development. We've heard the Commissioner talk about that. And obviously the Lord Mayor and Mayor mention you know, the, the great uh, investment in FDI in Cork, 194 multinational firms operating in the area um, across pharmaceuticals, technology and cyber security. So in your role um, with Science Foundation Ireland, um, how do you think Ireland's membership of the EU, as the Commissioner said, over 50 years, but also, and therefore by virtue Cork's membership, has helped contribute from an SFI perspective to growing that research and development sector in, in Cork even further? 
Yeah, thanks, Noelle, and thanks uh, for the invitation to, to be here. I mean, the Commissioner, you outlined some recent successes here that researchers in Ireland and in Cork here have been very successful in getting money for their research from the Commission. But I think there's a lot of researchers who would say, you know, particularly when you go back a couple of decades, before really the Irish government started investing significantly in research, that many researchers here were totally dependent on European funding. And in fact, the base that we built on when Science Foundation in Ireland was established about 20 years ago, much of those seeds were put in place by, by the Commission. So I think we can all be very thankful for that. And as you said, over the last number of decades, we've continued to grow that investment in research. And, and I think when we talk to our colleagues, you know, in the FDI sector, but also in the SME sectors now, we're seeing more and more that innovation is a key part of competitiveness. It's a key part of sustainability. <coughs> And much of our innovation and research in Ireland does happen in our higher education institutions. So it's great to see that funding continue to go in. Um, but, but I think, you know, in, in the recent past, you know, I spend a lot of my time researchers apply to us for funding and we look at their grant applications but we had the other experience where I with my colleagues in our government department applied to the commission for additional funding through the National Recovery and Resilience Facility you mentioned it, you know also funding the electrification here of some of the transport down in Cork but we were delighted because the commission awarded 72 million or, or asked Science Foundation Ireland to administer that on behalf of the Irish government the commission for, for something that was really inspired by the EU missions so it was this idea as well as having research that kind of goes from the bottom up which is critical researchers could also turn their ha their heads and their hands to problems you know from the grassroots that people are experiencing every day and can they come up with solutions so that was our idea could we find researchers and could we link them with people who normally don't work in research but have a real understanding of things that need solutions and could, could we get them to work on these solutions so that's what we said we would do and at the moment we've now found 96 teams and they're all working on problems that relate to the green transition and digital transformation and actually 14 of them are based down here in Cork so really exciting projects some taking what might be very simple ideas like attaching sensors to some of the shuttle buses that shuttle around the city to see can we pick up easily where the roads need to be maintained you know communities working with older people here to see what are the barriers to them getting out to walk because of we know all the benefits to them. You know, again, in the cybersecurity space, uh, MTU doing very good work there, looking to see how we can take something like the National Dairy Registry and use that as a really important piece of national data infrastructure and make sure that it is safe. So, you know, these are real projects that are happening on the ground today. In many ways, they're, they're little acorns, uh, re referencing back the oak trees. So, so we're not there yet. They're still in higher education, but they're projects inspired by real needs on the ground that are being supported by the Commission. I mean, today, flooding was something that came up, up a lot when researchers went and talked to people. And in fact, you know, this idea of having green spaces and, and in an urban environment, many of those green spaces are our gardens. So how can we guide people to use our gardens to protect us from flooding? How can we predict when floods are going to happen? So these are all really exciting projects that have been funded right now by the Commission. And we're on budget. I see Deeper here today. We're on, we're on target <laughs> and on budget so far. <laughs> And it's always appropriate to end on a deeper note. I know that I think, well, there you go. As a civil society organisation, I concur with that. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that. Really great to get a, get another practical insight on all the fantastic work that's been done in, in, in Cork and, and the exciting projects there. And David, finally, if I might turn to you, um, in your role as Director of um, uh, Southern Regional Assembly, I think it's probably fair to say you, you would have a really good on-the-ground perspective of, of how regional assemblies can bring the work that the Commission, the Commissioner are doing at a, at, a, at a European level closer to the citizen. And can you tell us a little bit about some of the regional operation funding and the regional development funds and some of the really good work that you're doing that maybe impacts on the growth and development of Cork even more? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much for the, for the invitation uh, to be here today. Delighted to be here. Unfortunately, I'm not from Cork, so hopefully people can understand my, <laughs> my flat Midlands accent. Um, it doesn't have the same dulcet tones as, as Cork people. But no, look, de delighted to be here. Um, maybe for those who don't fully, are not fully aware about the role of the regional assemblies, I might just mention that first. Um, there are three regional assemblies in Ireland. Um, we're part of the regional tier. Um, 
We have, a, I suppose, a key role in, I suppose, trying to achieve balanced region, regional development. Um, probably have two main tools to help us deliver that. One is that the Lord Mayor mentioned it, it's the Regional Spatial Economic Strategy. Effectively, that is to translate the objectives of the national planning framework and the government economic policies in, into regional level. And within that, I suppose, there is a particular um, focus on, on Cork um, as the second city, as a, a, a counterbalance for, for Dublin. So the regional strategy really emphasises the, the, the role of Cork in, in, in that space. Um, I suppose your role really is around EU funding that, that you mentioned, Noel. Um, and we've been a managing authority for EU funds for, um, God, almost 24 years now at this stage. Um, we're on our fourth generation of, of regional programmes. And in that, in that time, we've invested got over 800 million of EU funds in, in the region. So when I talk about the, the region, we're talking about the whole southern region and parts of the eastern region as well. So it's kind of all of Munster and, and, and parts of Leinster. And that, that has uh, invested funds in a whole raft of areas from, um, I suppose, the smart, innovative, competitive um, space, low carbon transition, um, energy efficiency, and also in, in, in the urban development space. Um, in our... In our, our Current generation of programme, there's another 267 million of EU funding to, to be invested. Um, both the, the Commissioner and the Lord Mayor mentioned a couple of the projects that, that we have invested in, in Cork. Um, you have the, the, the Marina Park, Mary Ellen's Bridge, um, which is a really good project here, linking the, the, the north and south of Cork in a pedestrian cycle route. Um, we also invested in the Triscoll Arts Centre um, back a number of years ago. Um, and then, of course, Cyber Innovate is going to be a crucial project in, in, in MTU. And there's just a small example of the types of projects um, that have been invested in Cork. I suppose one of the key benefits of the, um, the, the regional programmes is that shared management approach with the European Commission. So it means that the, the programmes are designed and developed where, by, I suppose, at, at the most local level where they can ha really have that, that impact. I think that, that shared management piece is critically important. And, and Donald kind of reference to, references it. It's about really identifying what are the challenges that we want to address and then design the schemes and, and the approaches to do that. So I think that, that has been critically important. I suppose one of the other areas that we're, we're very strongly involved in is around the European Territorial Cooperation, or Interreg, as a lot of people would know. So again, there's a whole raft of Interreg projects um, that have been funded uh, uh, across, across the, the Cork region. And a lot of these are used, I suppose, where I find the real benefit or innovative part of Interreg is it's for testing stuff testing approaches, testing technologies. You're not about maybe reinventing the wheel, but testing them in a new environment where they can really add value and add benefit. And again, I would say both Cork City and Cork County have been involved in quite a number of projects, particularly around the, the energy efficiency, the low carbon piece, which have really added value and I suppose are building on some of the policy objectives and areas that, 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 that they're, they're working in. her keynote speech and apologies I'm turning on my microphone again um, ladies and gentlemen over to you the audience or distinguished audience um, and apology if it looks like we're at the the helm of a I don't know a spaceship between the the slido screens I've mobiles I've my own laptop going I feel very innovative here I'm, I'm telling you we're, we're absolutely at the cutting edge here um, but can I we have a roving mic I think my colleagues have a roving mic and I might just ask you Please to be brief and to say your name and organisation. So I might go to this lady here on the, on the front, uh, and we also have questions coming in online as well. Yeah. So we'll just we'll just uh, we'll just we'll just take. I, I think did I see another hand over there raised? So we'll go take a couple together. Hi, uh, Cletvin, uh, Councillor Cletvin, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Just uh, in relation to the Commissioner, she talked about um, the private sector investing. Um, do you have concerns about the extent to which uh, there is so much money in private hands and how do you, um, I suppose, administer democratic oversight on that, that they do actually invest in productive and sustainable projects as opposed to, you know, some vanity projects that, you know, people might want to have? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor. And so, apologies, I, did I have a hand raised over on this side? No, I was just imagining that. Okay. Um, sorry, Doni. Yeah, Doni, did you want to come in there? And Doni used to also be my chairman when I worked in the Irish Cooperative Organisation Society. So there you go. The linkage is 
just a few words. Um, first of all, I think I want to highlight what Donald Sheehan has said. I think there has been too much, I'm speaking as, as a farmer, there has been somewhat too much emphasis on the negative rather than the positive. And I want to compliment him particularly on the work that he's done. I think it's very special that people realise that there's so much going on and we are, farmers are the protectors of the environment. And um, I, I must admit I'm, I'm no longer involved in farming politics, that's behind me, but at the same time I, I can never ignore it. I want to thank you now. I'm particularly interested because the, the principal speaker, I was actually invited by her to give a talk to Students' Union when she was in, in agricultural student in UCD, so I have a long relationship in that sense and I want to compliment her particularly on all the work she's done. Thank you. Oh, the commissioner is getting a, a huge fan club here today. She, she, we'll, we'll get her back down to Cork more often, I think. That's fantastic. And um, so, Commissioner, those couple of questions to you. Um, but I might also ask you as well, if I may, just in terms of the Slido. First question there from Bridget about given Cork's uh, sizable student population, what impact is the EU having on young people in Cork and how can they also unlock opportunities? So I'm going to hand over to you. Well, thank you for all the questions in the room and elsewhere. And Deputy Lord Mayor, I mean, yours is a huge question. The point I make is that we all as individuals try and save, which we encourage. But if you look to the US, people tend to invest so that their money works for them. Your question about how money is invested is a really crucial one. So I'm sure you're aware of the whole sustainable finance agenda, which is my responsibility in the commission. So we now have, if you like, put together pieces of a complicated jigsaw. We have a taxonomy on what is a sustainable uh, activity. We have uh, reporting requirements of the larger enlisted companies so that they report not just profit or loss, but sustainability. Um, and this is all new. Um, and the reason we have these reporting requirements is that investors, pension funds, or individuals who want to know where the money is going have quality information. The truth is today, companies can claim that they're green or sustainable by using different information. So I can't compare company A with company B. When we have all of our things in place, that will be possible. But here's the difficulty, and I'll be very frank, because I think we need frank conversations. It's an added complexity for companies. Um, and if some people regard it as a cost. I think it's an investment, because it has to be done. Because in the past, we know that our, and, and I think to complement the Bride Project, if you only look at production without taking account of other impacts, environmental, etc., then you don't get a good conclusion. So even in any company activities, whether it's in the agriculture sector or in mining or in whatever, you need to see the wider impact. And again, there's a complexity here because Europe drives what we call um, double materiality. So we ask companies to report on their impact on the environment and the impact of climate and the environment on them. The US doesn't do this. And if I listen to what's happening in the US today, there's really a pulling back from, from this idea of more sustainable investment. So that's in a nutshell and very short. We are working and have done a lot on this because information is absolutely key. And then to the third question on um, the students in Cork, the first thing I would say when we talk about democracy and Europe, vote in the local and European elections. Secondly, if I was a young person today, uh, if I'm not, I was <laughs> in the 1980s. And I think it was 1979 or 1980 when I would have asked um, Donny Cashman. I was secretary of the Agricultural Science Association. The minutes were hilarious. That's all I can even remember. I liked them. Uh, but we had no sight of opportunity. I would have, and many at that day, hands up those who are of a similar age, we, would, we begged for work. I got a contract with RTE for a trainee radio production course for three months. And I was delighted with that. And then I begged for every contract after that. Today, young people are sought after. And, and this is an interesting twist on what's happening in the world because it changes every time. Young people are beginning to ask, do I want to work the same as my parents? And they're asking this in Germany, in Ireland, in France. Do I have to go to the office? Can I not leave a job, take a break and move on? I would have been too terrified to even think of that. But, but I have to accept that there is a different um, you know, mindset. So I would think to the, the young people who've asked this very valid question, you have opportunities galore. 
and you have choices, which many of us in the past don't have, and I hope that those of the future have. Um, and I think you should seize them with both hands. And I would also maybe a plug for Europe and the institutions. We need more young Irish people with languages to come into the European institutions. A lot of them are leaving now because of age profile. So please look at that as an opportunity. Um, so, and good luck to all of you who are young. It goes very quickly, by the way. I was young once. <laughs> That's the hashtag theme for today's event. Now, I'm, 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 I'm just, I had, uh, sorry, the lady, sorry, yours, yourself, I had a question, and this gentleman here, and then, uh, and this lady as well. Can, but can everyone be really brief, because I'm a, don't mind, I'm afraid incurring the wrath of the... Uh, Councillor Lorna Bogue, um, and I'm sure as the Lord Mayor will attest, I will take my time. Um, Commissioner, I know your statements are bound by the policy of the Commission leadership on every topic, including Gaza, but I find it remarkable that someone of your seniority, both in Ireland and in Europe, who has had specific responsibilities for children's rights during your tenure as first Vice President of the European Parliament, that neither you nor the Commission have had much to say about the slaughter of thousands of children in Gaza. You spoke about respect for institutions in your keynote, but to me, there is little to respect in that. We are not talking here about combat casualties, but of children, in the knowledge that the Israeli Defence Forces have been using AI to decide how many innocents should die for each so-called legitimate target. I find it absurd that someone formerly so vocal on children's rights has said little about the deaths of more than 13,800 children in such a process. Do you not think that you have a moral duty as a senior Irish and European politician, as a woman and a mother, to address the genocidal scale of Israeli cruelty towards the women and children of Gaza? The Lord Mayor spoke of the population of Cork City at the beginning of this event. So here is an example of the scale. In the last census, there were 1,377 babies under one years of age in Cork City, 1,190 one-year-olds, 1,256 two-year-olds, 1,296 three-year-olds. You can do the maths, I'm sure. Were every child under the age of 12 in Cork City slaughtered deliberately, systematically, and in cold blood? What kind of response would that merit from the EU Commission? Because generational violence of that scale is what is happening in Gaza, under the eyes of the world, not just with the silence and acquiescence of the Commission, but with its aid and approval. This is an EU institution in which you are an influential person, a responsible person, as you said yourself. Commissioner, you said in your speech you would speak at this week's college meeting about what you have heard here today. That it is important to speak when you need to speak. So I hope that you are going to bring this message from the people of Cork. Um, this is not acceptable and the Commission must do something about it. Okay, thank you, Councillor. We're going to take this gentleman here and then that lady there. And again, if I could... If I could beg your indulgence and understanding from a timing perspective. Thank you. <coughs> uh, I'm Jose Ospina from Carberry Housing Association. We're a small rural uh, housing association based in Skibbereen. Uh, we uh, provide social housing mainly uh, through the mortgages to rent program. We actually purchase properties where people have been un un unable to pay their mortgages. Um, the main point that I wanted to raise here was... Um, point singular, please, please. Crowdfunding. Please. We are tied, we are linked to the financial institutions. And this is sadly a very limited channel of finance for organizations like ours in particular. We feel there is a need to democratize finance and crowdfunding offers the opportunity to do so. Crowdfunding is, is growing at a European level. There is a European crowdfunding platform that has actually lobbied for recognition of the sector and for the opening up of markets to the sector. That is, for us, a very valuable uh, connection. At the moment, the only finance we can get is through the Housing Finance Agency, which is very limited. It would open up tremendous possibilities if people were able to invest freely through something like a regulated crowdfunding platform. Uh, there even is a crowdfunding app now, which would allow you to invest through an app 
in any project of your choice. Again, that's got tremendous potential. Please find ways of using that potential effectively. Thank you so much. And, and I know the work of the Carberry Project was mentioned as earlier as well. Yes, sorry, the lady over there. And that, um, with apologies to our audience and online that we didn't get to everybody. Good afternoon, Liz Gavin from NUA Fund. We're an EU funding consultancy based down in Mallow. Uh, I spent 20 years working for the European Commission, so I know a little bit about the Brussels uh, bubble, let's say, and, and insights from giving out grants from the other side of the table. But coming back to the likes of uh, Donald there and projects like that, but also even circular economy type companies who have new business models coming out onto the market, how fit do you think our Irish banking system is, but even the European banking system, to deal with these new ideas, new innovations, new business models, to be able to finance them with the, the funds from banks in terms of loans, but looking at the circular models they have rather than a linear uh, profit-driven model straight away, which obviously isn't the case in many of these. So that would just, from that sustainable finance point of view, I'd be interested in your views. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put those last two questions together and then deal with the first question, if I may, um, because they, they, they speak of a problem with um, the current model. Um, my, my own view around the financial system, which I've been working in this job since 2020, the end of 2020, it has changed a lot because of digitalization. In Ireland, of course, we've lost two banks. Um, the mindset is beginning to change around the, the point you raised around sustainable finance and reporting about sustainability. And I think that when you ask about is the system fit for purpose for new ideas or uncertain, probably not, but it has to be driven to change. And I think that is happening. Um, I mean, the credit unions are also part of innovation uh, and providing finance. So it is a question, if there's enough pressure on the system, it will have to change. The reason I mention um, the sustainable finance and also capital markets union, banking union, which are technical topics, is because I think that we haven't really looked at how do we make liberate finance across Europe and how do we then accommodate different needs, including, and I think the uh, innovation, this European innovation project, the EPIs, uh, we've just heard an example of how that works. It has less constraints and less rules. It gives money, but it does require accountability, but not the detail. Um, so it's a point that I'll bring back to colleagues, that there is a concern around the financing of new ideas and innovations that don't just speak to return on investment immediately. Uh, so, so that's all I will say on, on both of those points. And then to the first point, which is a, a, one that occupies all our minds. And can I say, um, you may not have heard me shout uh, loud in public, but you can be reassured that the voice of the Irish people around the situation in Gaza has been heard where it matters, around the table of commissioners. They are very well aware, all of my colleagues, uh, many share my concerns and the concerns that you have voiced. Where I would take some exception, if I may, I think you said that with the aid, aid and approval of the commission, what was going on, and I think that is not the case. My colleague, Joseph Burrell, who looks after um, th these big issues, has certainly, if you look at his latest commentary, said very loudly, because of the scale of the humanitarian disaster and deaths and famine in Gaza, it is unacceptable. So perhaps you weren't aware, but I'm very happy to clarify very publicly that the words you used are words that I think many in this room have concerns about. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Michal Martin of this parish, has been extremely vocal on behalf of the Irish people, and I work very closely with him. The Taoiseach, today's Taoiseach, uh, Leo Varadkar, <laughs> has equally been very vocal, and rightly so. And if I listened carefully to the words of the incoming Taoiseach, Simon Harris, he could not have been clearer in his speech, and you know that I'm a member of that party. So I hope that reassures you of my work in this area, uh, and I, I hope I made the point, and if I didn't, I'll, I'll say it now, that sometimes those who shout the loudest do the least. And sometimes it's important to speak quietly to people and make change. Um, I could make many headlines by perhaps saying, but I could do very little to help people in Gaza. Um, my concerns are equally with those families in Israel who have not got back their mothers, fathers, children, the hostages that are there. And I think today is actually a date to remember for those in Israel 
as it is a day to, to weep for what's happening in Gaza. And the world has to reflect, and maybe this is my last point, I talked about institutions. We don't have strong global institutions that can stop this happening. And I think Europe needs to really push for the United Nations to be stronger so that we don't end up in a situation where the innocent suffer and the innocent get forgotten. So I hope you're reassured by that. But thank you for raising it. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner and, and audience and, and colleagues. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a testament to the quality and breadth of debate that we could have gone on for much, much longer. We already have, uh, as, so I'm grateful to the Commissioner for taking time out of her schedule. Um, so unfortunately, it falls on me to bring today's wonderful event to a, c a conclusion. May I thank uh, the Lord Mayor, uh, Anne and the team here, uh, in Cork City Hall to, to Councillor uh, Flynn, uh, the Mayor of County of Cork, um, and uh, to our fantastic panel and speakers. They, they thankfully might be able to stay along, uh, stay back a, a little bit uh, for, for people to have a chat with them. So to Ruth, Donal and David, um, may I thank you. And to our guest of honour and keynote speaker, the Commissioner, Mairead McGuinness. I think a round of applause for all our... <laughs> thank you very much. I think we've, we've I, I hopefully, you've all learned as much as I have today, um, Mwila Buika Scalaire. Um, the Access Program and colleagues from The Wheel, Emma, are outside. If you have, uh, want to get some more information on how to access EU initiatives for your own project or ideas, like the Carberry Project, like the Bride Project, please do check them out. And thank you for braving the tro atrocious weather that afflicted us all this morning. We nearly had to swim swim, swim to get in here today, but uh, delighted to see so many people joining us in person and to those following you online. Um, uh, it's great to have so many here uh, for today's European Commission event. A big thank you to the European Commission representation in Ireland, uh, in Dublin, who do such fantastic work. To its head, Barbara Nolan, members of the team here today, Maeve and Helen, and also, if I may on my own behalf, extend my heartfelt thanks to the incredibly hardworking European Movement Ireland team and our colleagues here today. A huge amount of work goes into making events such as these run and, and be the success, hopefully, that you all feel they are. So to Kieran, Mary, Anya, Ashling, Emma and Wern and colleagues back in Dublin, um, a big thanks to them. And finally, the next roadshow of this, so uh, Commissioner, we'll, we'll keep you posted on that, but I think we head to the Westmeath and the Midlands next. Um, so that's going to be in Mullingar on the 25th of April. If any of you want to join us there, head up the, what is it, M8? Anyway, up that direction. Um, you're more than welcome. We'd love to see you there for the European Commission event. But for now, thank you all very much. Slán and safe home. Thank you.